So I want to start by repeating what I said uh, on Monday. It's awfully quiet here. Nobody asks uh, during lectures. So again, please never hesitate to interrupt. I have 85 pages for today, which is twice as much as I can handle. So it doesn't matter where I stop, when I stop. So really don't, don't feel uh, shy about this. And the other thing is I wanted to make a remark. I see S Steve is here. So you asked me about Hausdorff uh, topology last time. And so my answer eventually was correct. So I remembered correctly. We tried, couldn't prove it. So we don't know. We simply don't know. OK, so this is not. Oh, is that it? Oh, OK. All right. <laughs> OK, so today is um, last time we had uh, basics of spectral switch functions. Today I'm going to give you a uh, application, if you want, uh, maybe a little unusual application to Fredholm indices and also two operators that are not Fredholm, but still have something like an index, the Witten index. And so I'm going to see, show you what this has to do with uh, spectral sheet functions. Uh, so here's a little bit of uh, motivation. Uh, this all started in the later 80s, so a long time ago. There were no uh, archives, there was no internet, uh, no email even at that point when we started this. So some of you uh, clearly cannot imagine that in those days, you got information from other institutions via preprints that were sent by ordinary regular mail. And so in Graz, we had a pile, uh, lots of piles actually, of preprints ordered with respect to different institutions and also always a pile about new stuff that just came in. And so suddenly I saw preprints where people were interested in supersymmetric quantum mechanics. And so I sort of got excited and started to read a little and then I realized they're analyzing one-dimensional systems, Schrodinger and Dirac, with scattering theoretic methods. And then this name Witten index appeared. And they called it regularized index, but they sort of indicated, and there's some truth to that, that Witten uh, suggested a particular regularization of a Fredholm index. Then I looked at this and I saw a scattering phase shift. And at that point, I had already learned a little about the Krein spectral shift function. I knew that for systems where you have ordinary scattering uh, situations, the scattering phase shift is a spectral shift function. So I made the connection that maybe these indices are spectral shift functions or special values of spectral shift functions, which turned out to be true. So this is how this started. So um, uh, what these physicists were very interested in, sorry for that, was that the index exhibited certain topological invariance, it was called. It meant that only asymptotic properties of your coefficients played a role, not the local structure. It was fascinating, of course. And uh, at that point, I didn't understand why, how this could, could come about. But you will see today, there's actually very nice mathematical formalism behind all this. Another thing that was exciting, these indices, these Witten indices, were not necessarily integers. Sometimes they were a half. Of course, when you're a physicist, like I was in some sense in those days, you immediately remember Don Levinson's theorem. If you have a threshold resonance, you get sometimes a half integer contribution. It's a half pound state, as the physicists like to call it. There's a reason for that half. And so, again, this pointed towards trying the spectral shift function and see what, what it can say in this context. Anyway, so you see, um, there's a little of that written here. So in the late 80s, we tried to understand this and wanted to understand in particular, what does this mean in a more abstract setting? OK. So So one of the things that 
I saw early on is that people were really fascinated by all sorts of Dirac type operators. Um, when they have a mass term, it's typically a Fred Holmes situation. But there are plenty of reasons to study massless Dirac operators, especially very recently there are connections to, uh, with graphene. I don't know too much about this, but I tried to pick uh, Hermann's brain and he gave me some references, so I hope to learn more about this. So clearly that is a, is a, uh, a field in flux. People have interest in uh, massless Dirac operators. Cl traditionally, from a quantum mechanical point of view, this is unusual. You would have a mass term normally. Uh, but anyway, graphene, of course, is a totally different application. It has nothing to do with relativistic quantum mechanics, at least not from the outset. And so uh, the extension to massless Dirac operators is something that we study now in this context. And once you have massless Dirac operators, you should imagine the, the mass gap from minus m to plus m shrinks and disappears in the limit. That's a problem. It is much, much simpler to handle self adjoint operators if they have some real points in their resolving set. Half semi-bounded, for instance, like showing even order operators. Well, the Dirac operator is not semi-bounded, but at least it usually has a gap. Well, if the mass goes to zero, you should expect no gap at all, which mathematically makes life interesting and complicated. Anyway, so that's a little bit of introduction. Physics, you also have lots of transitions like it, but for bounded operators. And nevertheless, this interesting thing happens. Actually, so. we will see lots of Dirac type operators today, which are just differential uh, operator analogs of your discrete version. So you had the bounded case. I will focus basically on the unbounded case throughout. So the, uh, but yes, uh, Dirac operators are, are, are everywhere. And yes, it's true, of course. Uh, there are reasons for solid state physicists to study uh, limiting cases like that. But I'm, I sort of was indoctrinated originally as a student by uh, relativistic quantum mechanics, and then you had a mass term typically. Okay, so here's my uh, list of notations. You saw this already, it's the same. So I'm repeating it uh, very quickly. H is a separable Hilbert space, I is the identity. Uh, the resolvent set is denoted by rho, the spectrum by sigma. If we need more about point spectrums, a set of eigenvalues, it's sigma p. Sometimes we talk about discrete spectrum, and uh, it's uh, complement the essential spectrum in a self adjoint context in particular. And if A is closable, then A bar will denote its closure. All right, I have a little more. So at times we need uh, other things than bounded operators, so subclasses. So last time we discussed B1, it's a set of trace class, so these are trace ideals as it's called. Their singular numbers are in little lp, that's really the precise definition of them. They don't have to be self adjoint at all. B2, so when P is 2, it's the set of Hilbert-Schmidt operators. B infinity in this sense, so when you take P to infinity, you would recover the compact operators. Traces as usual by Litzke's theorem, if you have a trace class operator, I talked quite a bit about how non-trivial it is to verify that an operator is trace class versus how easy it is to verify that an operator is Hilbert-Schmidt. So that of course is the same here. Well, once we have a trace class operator, we can define a determinant at least of a trace class perturbation of the identity and then get the usual formula you expect products of the S. Okay. That's not always enough. We had some cases last time in two and three dimensions, scattering theory systems we, we looked at, where we needed modified Fredholm determinants. So those are regularized infinite products. The analytic structure, especially when you introduce a parameter z here, is still the same, but you have a convergence improving factor here that you didn't need at this point when you were trace class, but you would need it when you are only Hilbert-Schmidt. Uh, no, I, no, it's just convenient for me. Uh, I, I could easily, yes, of course, I could easily do it. So when, when you look at uh, 
perturbation determinants, then of course you get the other version of that. Okay, so let me talk a little about phantom indices and then about non phantom situations. So we had now two lectures uh, by um, Hermann full of indices for phantom operators. Uh, so he gave a little introduction. I'm going to give a slightly bigger one, and then uh, I will focus on unbounded phantom operators, which is an interesting beast, and for differential operators quite quite appropriate. For difference operators, typically you get away with bounded phantom operators, but for differential operators, nothing's bounded in general. So let me uh, start with a few abstract facts here. So the operator is non-negative. If for all f in the domain, this scalar product is non-negative. Sometimes we talk about strict positivity. Well, then we actually have a lower bound epsilon here times the norm of f uh, squared. So the f's always have to be in the domain of the operator in question. So I'm allowing unbounded operators. So this is not it's typically true for a dense set. Very interesting is a more celebrated result by von Neumann that says the following. T star T, and also T T star, whenever T is closed, so we had uh, introduction into closed operators recently and densely defined, these two combinations, which you should think of absolute value squared, right, in some sense that's what it is, are self, oops, sorry, are self adjoint and non-negative as you expect from an absolute value. There's actually a uh, one-line proof uh, due to Ed Nelson, which does the following. He doesn't look at these guys directly, but he looks at a Dirac type operator. So this is what I would call a supersymmetric Dirac type operator, and Hermann's talks were full of them. They were all over the place in a discrete context. So you have an operator and an adjoint in the off diagonal, and say zero, you could also have m and minus m if you like, like uh, Dirac operators with mass in the diagonal, but I will mostly focus on zero here. And all that Nelson suggests is just square the guy. It's easy to see, that needs another line, that this is self-adjoint if t is closed and densely defined. And if you square it, you have von Neumann's operators in the diagonal, and the square of a self-adjoint operator is of course non-negative, so the diagonals are non-negative, and that gives a proof of von Neumann's theorem. So this is a very elegant way uh, to show this. But what's the domain of t star t? It's the direct sum of uh, the domains of t and t star. Works out. Yeah. No, no, I, I understand. You, you talk about this guy. It's still. It's, it's, still, it's still a direct sum of the two. Now, here's an interesting statement, and this is sort of at the heart of index theory. If you compare the spectra of t star t and t t star, then one statement one can make is that if lambda is an eigenvalue of one of them with some multiplicity, well, that happens if and only if it is also an eigenvalue of the same multiplicity of the other operator. So it goes both ways. But notice one thing. I said lambda strictly positive. More is true. So away from the kernels, so in the complement of their kernels, these operators not only have the same eigenvalues with the same multiplicity, they are actually unitary equivalent. So very strong statement. Now you might wonder, so what about lambda equals zero? Well, you cannot say anything. And that's precisely the origin of index theory, because the difference of the kernel of t and kernel of t star, by the way, the kernel of this operator t star t equals the kernel of t, the kernel, so the null space of t t star equals the null space of t star, so the difference of those is, of course, what we will soon define as an index under one technically additional assumption about a closed range. So really this fact that zero can be different for these operators 
is at the heart of index theory. This is where index theory starts. Let me also say one thing. One normally defines, and we will do so in a minute, uh, index theory for t and t star, which are not self-adjoint. They are closed, densely defined operators. So the trick here is to actually look at these self-adjoint non-negative operators, and you have a lot more tools at your disposal. Okay? So there's a good reason why you don't look at t alone, but you look at t star d, and you don't look at t star alone. Instead, you look at t t star. Okay. So let's be a little more formal. So here's then the definition of a, uh, un, un, in general, unbounded uh, Fredholm operator. It's exactly what Hermann had in his uh, lecture, except I do have to say that the range of t needs to be closed. If you have a bounded operator t, you don't need that. It's a consequence of the finiteness of the kernel of uh, dimension of the kernel of t, and the same for t star. Well, if it is, why not? Because when you formulate this in Banach space, you formulate this with the coordinate. And this is a different thing than the adjoint. Mm. No, in the Hilbert space context, it, this is correct. I don't think so. Not, not in the Hilbert. Banach, I, I'm not talking Banach spaces. No, in the Hilbert space, and if you formulate the index with the adjoint, then you need to do this. Okay, I need, I need to double check this. And discuss this. We should discuss this. I, I don't. I don't think so. It's a different formulation for Banach spaces. It has to do with the no, I understand for Banach spaces, this, uh, you do the co-kernel and all that. I understand. And the co-kernel is a different thing than the orthogonal complement, which you implicitly have here when you take the kernel of the joint. For a bounded operator? Yes. Yes. I need to double check. To okay. Uh, let's not worry. All my operators are going to be unbounded in this lecture, so I'm safe in some sense, but uh, this needs to be double-checked. And if it's necessary, I will change it. By the way, I have all these pages which I cannot discuss, of course, so they will all be uploaded and be available eventually. By Monday or so, it should be, should be available. So Carlos will take care of that. All right, so if you have these conditions, so if the operator is right home, then the index is defined by the difference of the dimension of the kernel of t, and I put immediately here, because it's true, the variant for self-adjoint non-negative operators. Okay? Here are a few facts, and so here is a disputed one at the moment, but let's look at one and two. So t is fatal if and only if t star is, and there is an actually simple, well simple, at least a, in some sense convenient criterion to check with an operator is Freton. In terms of the self-adjoint operator T star T, all you look at, you look at its essential spectrum, and if it's strictly bounded away from zero, then you are afraid home. Okay? So, and, and it's important, this is why this is in red, don't look just at t star t, look also at t t star. If both are strictly bounded away from zero, then your operator was fret home. And usually we have a lot of techniques to determine essential spectra. So this is a practical condition. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, Hermann had this uh, I, I'm in, in, a, in a slightly uh, weaker version. So Hermann said, the Fredholm index is uh, invariant with respect to compact perturbations. So what I'm doing here is I'm looking at relatively compact perturbations. So it's not that the perturbation S is compact, but S times the resolvent of T is supposed to be compact. Well, in other that conditions, both are Fredholm. If T is, then so is T plus S, and their index doesn't change. So this is a first invariant statement. And uh, for physicists, uh, perturbations like this sometimes mean local de deformation of coefficients. Not asymptotically, but locally. And local deformations can be relatively compact. And so this is where uh, this lies at the heart of what's called topological invariance context. OK, so this is what's uh, repeated here. 
Another thing that's uh, fundamental, you see this on the bottom here, is the uh, product formula for the index. I don't know that, maybe Herman had that too, but I don't remember now. Anyway, so the idea is make sure that your product is well defined and, and densely defined. And this is sort of the maximal way how you would define the product of S and T, first T, then S. So if both are Freytorm, so that S T is densely defined, turns out the product is Freytorm, and the index is additive when you have a product on the left hand side. So that's another, that together with the relatively compact uh, in, invariance properties, sort of so some of the most famous properties of the Freytorm index. So I decided to add a little more here about, um, I'm not going to go through, in, through this in detail now, but let me say what the next six pages or so, that, which I added yesterday uh, after, after Herman's talk, contain. So they basically contain all the results now in a two Hilbert space version. So there's, so far we had only one Hilbert space, but it's not necessary. So there's a two Hilbert space version. And in particular, I wanted to describe this homotopy invariance also for un, in the unbounded case. It takes a little collecting. I mean, the results are all available, but you need to know where. And so uh, it actually, uh, we needed this for a different project not that long ago. It took a little time to, to collect it from various sources, which I have written down uh, after the end of, uh, of these next few pages. So here is a slightly more general situation now, a two Hilbert si uh, space situation. And I've changed my notation, I'm sorry for that, but I copied it from, from a lecture notes in math that we recently wrote. So T suddenly became S, but otherwise there's no change. Uh, closed and densely defined, range closed, sum of uh, dimensions uh, of the two kernels finite, so both dimensions finite. Uh, index is still defined by the difference. And at one point, you will see a graph Hilbert space. This was already mentioned by UC, right? You had graph Hilbert spaces. I think so. Anyway, so this is, uh, I'm, I'm repeating this here. This is sometimes uh, a, a convenient way to reduce an unbounded situation to a bounded situation by changing from the original Hilbert space to the graph Hilbert space. And that's why working with two Hilbert spaces is actually quite convenient in this context, okay? So this is a technical tool that has, has certain advantages. All right, so here's now a long theorem with all the results that uh, we had before and a few more about unbounded Freytorm operators. So uh, I denote them by phi now, they map from H1 into H2. And then here's also just very quickly what we mean by, uh, uh, by homotopy between, between uh, so in this case, the, the homotopic stuff here I do in the bounded case, but I will use the graph Hilbert space and therefore it applies to the unbounded situation. All right, so two Hilbert spaces and then the following properties are true. So here's the product formula again. Here is the, uh, this is what, what Hermann had. So you add a compact operator, index doesn't change. I didn't uh, repeat, I think, the relatively compact version here, but of course there is one. Here is, in fact, this is sort of hidden, hidden in there. Uh, you see here I change my point of view a little. Rather than going from H1 to H2, I now go from the graph Hilbert space. And this is where the relative compact thing is actually hidden. So I, I did have it. Again, you have invariance of the Freytorm index. So uh, this is a nice way of doing the relatively compact situation. Here's a little more of this. So we have eight points all together. So this is about perturbations which are small. You see there's an epsilon. So the perturbation here is R. So I have S plus R. One is red, the other is blue, but somehow blue, this, this uh, setup hates blue. So it doesn't, and the red too, it doesn't come out. It looks actually much, much more brilliant on, uh, on, the, on the little machine. Anyway, uh, all the perturbations here are blue. The original Freytorm operator is in red. And so the idea is if you, 
pick a bounded operator and you start with the Fredholm operator, you can find a small enough epsilon such that the following is all true. Namely, if R has norm less than epsilon, then the sum stays Fredholm, and you have situations like that. Uh, here is a statement that yeah, we actually missed earlier when we just did the one Hilbert space case. If you go from S to S star, of course, you just change the sign of your index. There's a little more about uh, graph Hilbert spaces and so on. I think I'm going to leave that for a second more detailed reading. And at the very end, I have this uh, homotopy statement. And again, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's easy to rewrite this in terms of graph Hilbert spaces, so it does apply to the unbounded case. So in particular, the index is a locally constant homotopy invariant. OK, here is, uh, oh, this is another corollary, but I guess I'll leave that for further reading. Here is the references I used for this. So uh, some are more recent, some are classic. This is a, a standard reference in this game. So is this one here. These are older ones, I mean, not that old. But actually, some of these are in second edition, so this, this is a little misleading. This, this is the original edition is older. Anyway, so there's all sorts of useful books. If you look at those, I have the chapter numbers, because those are thick books in general. I have uh, chapter numbers to help uh, if someone needs to take a closer look at this. OK, what's a written index? Why would I even want to look at this? Well. I will discuss two situations, one that's based on resolvents and one that's based on semigroups. The semigroup methods are usually always more general, that's a fact, but it's hard to beat the resolvent equation. So technically, to work with resolvents, if you can afford to do so, is simpler. Now, there's a DML formula, as we, as we heard uh, uh, recently, but uh, it's not the same as the resolvent formula. It's nothing as convenient. As a, as a second resolvent formula. Anyway, so let's do the resolvent part first. So again, whenever I want to talk about T, I will actually talk about T star T and then related, instead of T star, I will talk about T T star. And so what I'm assuming here is that the difference is trace class. Difference of the resolvents is trace class. And then I'm going to introduce what people call a resolvent regularization. So I look at this trace, now that it's trace class, I can take the trace. And I do this uh, to be uh, away from the spectrum with a minus lambda here. So lambda itself is negative, And I multiply by minus lambda. And what I want to do is I want to take the limit as lambda goes to 0 from the left. OK, so this is what's called the resolvent regularized Witten index. So the little r here is for resolvent. We'll use an s for semigroups on the next page. OK. Now, you can see that if lambda goes to 0, you get something interesting. If, if t or t star has some spectrum at 0, something happens, you get 0 over 0. And then who knows? OK, we'll, we'll find out what happens. Now, you can do this with semigroups, and as I said, for applications, very often this is a much stronger possibility. So again, t is my closed densely defined operator. I pick a t0 positive, and then I want that the semigroups of t star t, they are both non-negative, so semigroups are well defined. Their difference has to be trace class. If it's true for one t0, then you can see it's true for all larger t's, and that's what I need. I want to go with t to infinity this time. And so here's my semi-group regularized object, I just take the trace with a t there, t larger than or equal to t0. Now in the written index, now semi-group regularized, if you want, there's the s. It's the same thing, but now the t, of course, should go to infinity. And you see, if these operators have something happening at 0, that will survive that limit somehow. Okay. You again get an 
at the moment, ill-defined situation, it seems. But actually, you get something nice, as we will soon see. So here is um, an old result, as you can see. This is what we, what is maybe our second or third attempt after we started to look at this in the late 80s. So here's a little, little result. Suppose T is Fredholm, and in order to do the uh, resolvent part, assume resolvent difference of T T star and T star T is trace class. Then the statement is, because T is Fredholm, the Witten index, this limit that I had, where I took the trace of this and then multiplied by minus lambda and wanted to take lambda to zero. Let's go back and take a quick look at it. Right, This was it. You see, you take the trace, you multiply by minus lambda, and then you would like to take lambda to zero from the left. So the statement now is, you can do that. So if you know that you are Fredholm, it gives you the Fredholm index. But it does more. It also gives you the value of a spectral shift function for the pair t, t star, t star, t, now from the right. So it's zero plus. OK? So this is already interesting. Now you can do exactly the same for semigroups. And no surprise, the semigroup regularized written index exists, is the Fredholm index, and there's, of course, the same number. The spectral shift function at zero, but from the right. That function C may well have a jump at zero, so its values from the left and from the right might be different. Uh, I am normalizing my C. Remember, Xs are defined up to constants we discussed last time, but if you're bounded from below, in, in particular both are bounded from below, and we know that both are non-negative by von Neumann's theorem, I'm going to define it to be zero near minus infinity and go from there. That uniquely fixes it. And therefore, this is well defined now. Once I make it unique, saying I come from the right, makes sense. Now, I actually have a proof of this result here, but I, I need to worry a little. So 1235 or so, another 40, 50, 45 minutes. Huh? Well, maybe I leave the... Uh, I don't know. I wanted to show you some proof. So maybe I, sh I show you something here in the resolvent case and not in the, in the semigroup case. So the first result I'm going to look at is why is the Witten index the C function from the right? Well, uh, you can see this as follows. And keep in mind, uh, it's not just a trace class and uh, semigroup uh, hypothesis. Of course, the assumption still is that T is Fredholm. Uh, that's the overarching assumption. We want to prove the consistency between Witten and Fredholm index if this resolvent or semigroup trace class conditions are satisfied. So T is still Fredholm here. And then um, you first of all remember that such an integral is 1. That's just a little calculus. And then this is what I do. I know that because T is Fredholm and therefore T star T is Fredholm, I uh, have the same for t star, and therefore also uh, t t star is Fredholm. I know that the essential spectra need to start at a strictly positive value for both of them. Okay, that was one of the convenient criteria for Fredholm, and so I can actually do the following: I, I write down uh, my regularized index, which is exactly this object. Right? See, this is what we define to be delta. Then I use uh, the trace formula in terms of spectral shift functions, which we discussed at length in the first lecture. When you have a situation like this, you can express it in terms of xi. You can compute traces. That was, after all, the main message of the spectral shift function. It computes traces for you. OK, let's compute the trace. This is it. Now you see what I do. I'm, I'm doing a little trick. This is my, my result here. But I'm adding and subtracting a number. And I choose, of course, exactly the number I want this to be in the limit. Okay. I can do this here because the integral is 1. Okay? So I'll just keep that last line uh, in, in, in mind because we will show that this goes to 0. And this remains in the limit as lambda goes to 0 from the left. 
And so here it comes. Uh, I took this guy out. I look at this. And now I realize my integral doesn't start at 0. This integral here, even though formally it starts at 0, once I have a difference, C is constant. Because the essential spectrum starts at epsilon. And between 0 and epsilon, yes, you may have eigenvalues, but both operators have the same eigenvalues, and things cancel. So C is actually locally constant between 0 and delta. Well, if it's constant, the difference gives 0, and you start at delta then. Some delta. Doesn't matter what delta is. And uh, that's what I do here. Now you see immediately this guy goes to 0. And all, all that remains in the end is, so, so this, this is easily dismissed. This is ab arbitrarily small, so it's also dismissed. And out comes the limit. And exactly the same computation can be done with, with semigroups, but I'm going gonna, gonna to leave that. Now, I still would have to show you why there is consistency. So yes, we have now seen that the written index either resolve and regularized or semigroup regularized equals C. I still need to show it's equal to the uh, Fretum index. So this is done, actually. So I have a little proof for that, too. And again, I'm using the fact that there is a delta for which there is no difference here. C is locally constant in a small interval. And that's all that, 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 uh, that you need. Uh, you can, uh, here I do it for the, uh, I think for the uh, semi-group case first, and, and you see that uh, uh, after, uh, very, very quickly uh, you show that it's actually equal to the Freytom index. So there's a little more about uh, the history of all this, but let me actually now go to what we really wanted to do in the late 80s, show that there are stability properties of this Witten index. Now, from the outside, uh, from the outset, I should tell you two things. First of all, we will come to examples which illustrate this very nicely. First of all, that Witten index need, need not be an index at all. It can be any real number, and there are nice examples for that. For instance, in a two-dimensional magnetic field system, it's the magnetic flux, which is not quantized in this system. Any real number is possible. OK, that's strange, but it's a fact. The other thing is, um, since it's not an index, why would you even expect stability properties? So actually, from the outset, this looks bad. And yet, one can prove stability results. Now, in the Fredholm case, all you need to be is relatively compact. That's a relatively weak assumption. And then the index is invariant under a relatively compact perturbation, so it's stable. Here, relatively compact, we can easily show, is not sufficient. There are counterexamples. But relatively trace class, in some sense, and I, I have to use quotation marks, it's a little more than that, but you will see from the assumption that I will show you soon, it's basically a relative trace class assumption. That will give us stability of the Witten index. Okay? So, you, you have a much more general object, so obviously you need, to, you need to squeeze it more to get stability out of it. And relatively compactness is not enough, so there are counterexamples for that. Okay, so here's the setup for proving uh, stability properties. So what do we want to do? Well, we start with an operator T, then we're going to perturb it. I have a parameter here. Parameter does not have to be small. It's just a parameter, a real parameter. And S is my, my perturbation. So again, red is the uh, original object, and blue is the uh, perturbation here. And so let's take a look at So what I want to show. You see it, you see it on the bottom. I actually will show two results. The whole, regular, uh, uh, regularized index, so this is before you go to the limit where t goes to infinity, that alone is already invariant. And of course, if the limit exists as t goes to infinity, then the semi-group regularized Witten index would be the same. OK, so that's what I'm aiming at. But in fact, a lot more, not just the limit as t goes to infinity should be invariant. And so it should not depend on the perturbation here. 
even the thing, the step before you take the limit is actually invariant. So let me, just to be sure, I don't know whether I have a formula for that on the next page or not. No, let's go back for a second. That doesn't take much, just to be sure. Here it is. So this is the object I'm talking about, OK? I have to, it's just the difference of the semigroups, the trace of it. It depends, of course, on t. That's the subscript t here. That's the object we just looked at, OK? So let's go back to that. Here we are. So this statement, I claim, is already invariant. OK, what are the assumptions? Well, some are harmless and some are not harmless. So the first one is harmless. For some power here, negative power, you want this to be bounded. Well, that's nothing. That's easily verified. OK? That's harmless. Well, obviously, we need, uh, we need a trace uh, class assumption. That's not harmless, but it's obvious for what I'm doing. You cannot live without that. What's non-trivial is the thing in the middle. Yeah, that's, that's a non-trivial assumption. This is why I said relatively trace class. Okay? So that, in applications, may or may not be satisfied. We have examples where it is, and of course there are examples where it's not. Anyway, under these assumptions, I will now show you algebraically. This is not a proof, but it's the, it's the idea of the proof why this should be invariant. In fact, not even just in the limit, as I said, but already a step earlier, before you take the limit t going to infinity. So there's a very rigid supersymmetric structure behind all this, which makes this possible. OK, so let's look, take a look at the algebraic, at the idea of the proof, OK? The, the details are a little dif a different story. But let me tell you the idea. So you introduce another Dirac type, supersymmetric Dirac type operator. Sometimes called a supercharge, but never mind, these are just names. So it's t, t star on the off diagonal, and I, I, I only need zeros on the diagonal. Here's my perturbation, also off diagonal. So I'm looking at t plus s, and then of course, t plus s star. Here's a Pauli matrix. Actually, let me remind you of something that Hermann had. Here it is. He said that his Dirac operators are equivalent to minus the Dirac operator with a Pauli matrix. This works, of course, in this abstract context here. So this is very interesting because the Pauli operator sigma 3 is unitary. So what this tells you, it tells you Q is unitarily equivalent to minus Q for any beta, actually, not just for beta equals 0. OK? That's, of course, at the heart of the proof here. Anyway, so that's why I introduced sigma 3 here. So we add. So we make the perturbation. Then we square them. Remember Ed Nelson's trick? Done again, of course. So when you square, you just get the diagonal terms in both cases, zero of the off diagonals. And it is what, what you expect it to be, right? t star t, t t star, and the same here with t plus beta s. So that's all algebraic. OK. Here's the proof that this thing is invariant under the perturbation beta r. Why? I'm going to differentiate with respect to beta, and I get 0. It doesn't depend on beta. If it doesn't depend on beta, I may as well take beta equals 0. And that's my invariance. Okay? So once again, if I take uh, beta equals 0, I'm back at q. And, and, and that this is, in fact, 0 is a, at this level, algebraically, uh, uh, is really just, just looking at, at terms and use the fact that these two anti-commute. So Q and the uh, Pauli matrix anti-commute. And uh, these things also anti-commute. They are off diagonal. It fits together perfectly. So trivially, you get that this thing is 0 formally when you differentiate. And therefore, this thing doesn't depend on beta at all. So you may as well take beta equals 0. And that's uh, on the next page what gives you immediately this statement before you go to the limit, OK? Now, how do you really prove this? Well, actually, you follow these steps. But it, you have to interchange a lot of things. Cyclicity of the trace is used. At every step you have to prove, you can do it. That's where these conditions ended the game that I had earlier. So one has to painstakingly go through every single step. It's doable, not a big deal. The idea is exactly what I showed you. 
you can do exactly the same for resolvents. It's a little disheartening, and you see the power of semigroups here, because I think we see this here. You need a lot more assumptions for in the resolvent case. But even that can be used in applications sometimes. Semigroup case is easier to handle. Anyway, I'm not going to go through this in detail. You do exactly the same trick. You differentiate, you get zero, you use commutation properties. And at least on the algebraic level, that's the idea. And then you go back and do it very carefully, step by step. Let me show you an example. After all, I promised the Witten index can be anything. Any real number is possible. Here's the example. It's a non-trivial one to some degree. It's in two dimensions. It's a magnetic field system. You see, there's a minimal coupling with a, a magnetic vector potential. But this is all in two dimensions. So my, uh, my magnetic field, you can actually use a scalar quantity because you're in two dimensions. And the Laplacian of that potential, if you want, is actually the, uh, describing the underlying magnetic field. You need some assumptions. C2 property of phi. Here is the asymptotics. This is the flux here. I have a formula for it. Yeah, here it is. You integrate over P and you normalize. The constant plays no role later on, and so there should be a term that's of order my x to the minus epsilon. So these are the assumptions on phi, the gradient, and the Laplacian on phi. Then you do the following. So T is our operator whose index, in fact, Witten index, we would like to compute. Uh, t star t and t t star are my non-negative self-adjoint operators. I do everything, if I can, in terms of t star t and t t star. Well, and they're actually quite nice. You see, there's a minimal coupling and there's a plus minus the magnetic field. That's the only difference between t star t and t t star. What's bad, however, and that's why it's interesting, the spectrum is easily seen, the half line. These guys are not Fredholm. Okay, because for the essential spectrum, I need an epsilon here, but I don't have an epsilon, so it's not Fredholm. You can't compute the Fredholm index of this object. It's not a Fredholm operator, but you can compute the Witten index. And so it follows uh, the assumptions that I showed in both cases, the resolvent and the semigroup uh, situation. And here's what you get. A big surprise at, at first. Already the Resolvent, I, I do this here for resolvents. The same is true for semi-group regularized objects. The resolvent regularization, which I, I wrote down here again, it's the difference of the resolvents, take the trace, multiplied by z. Well, turns out it's z independent, and it's minus the flux. Constant. OK? So of course, the limit as z goes to 0 is constant. It's, it's the flux. The flux wasn't quantized. Any real number is possible. OK? So what, I'm, what we discussed, actually, but it's not written here. Before I go a little further on this page, let me talk about invariance for, for a moment. So what this tells you is you can, you can play with phi now locally. You can deform it, as long as you satisfy these conditions and don't change the leading asymptotic behavior, because that's what gives you the Witten index. Okay? As long as this is fixed, this number, times log mod x. Locally, you can do whatever you want to phi. This is only at infinity. Right? This is the topological invariance of this system, of course. And you will always get the same uh, object f, that flux. So in particular, if you use this general stability theory, you could also add a compactly supported yes. perturbation? Absolutely. If phi is of compact support in C2 no, I and... Mean, like a potential perturbation. Um, I have what to... I, I, I have to think. I shouldn't. Uh, you mean electric potential now? Yeah. I think we could satisfy the, the assumptions. It seems plausible, but I, 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 I would have to really check it out. But it seems plausible. In any case, the phi can locally be deformed now. That, that's obvious. As long as you keep the asymptotic minus f log mod x uh, constant. Anyway, Witten index is minus f. Here's sort of the difference of the dimensions. You can compute that. And depending on the sign of the flux, this integral over b, you get minus n or minus n minus 1, depending on whether the flux is n or a little larger than n. So there are, there's a paper by Aronoff and Kasher which actually figured this out 
before we even got interested in this. And so the spectral shift function for this pair, let me remind you what H1 and H2 was. So here they are. This kind of Pauli type operators, right, with plus or minus B. This is H1 and H2. You have a formula that says for the corresponding spectral shift function, it's a step function and just multiplied by the flux. That's why, of course, this is all so simple here. So what you say is there is a kernel, there are two kernels, yeah? Yeah. An integer and somehow this middle yeah. gives you the, yeah. the, close, the numbers closest by. Exactly. It, 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 it chooses whatever, what, uh, continuous interpolation or whatever, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, so that's a non-trivial example and that illustrates a few things I said earlier. In particular, that you have uh, non-integer behavior, but stability, even though it's not an index. OK, so we have almost one, so half an hour sort of, right? Is that correct? I guess so. Yes, 35 minutes. 25. 35. 35. Now, I don't, I don't want to. Uh, warn me anyway 10 minutes before, so that I, I have a tendency of going over, and I do not want to do this today. OK, so here's now a, a different situation. So this is something we have. So this was in the late 80s, what I have shown you so far. There was a long break. And around 2009, we got really interested in this again. But in many ways, uh, in, uh, in a case where, so we are looking at now a Hilbert space that deals with vector valued objects. So think of a direct integral, for instance. So in the example I just showed you, H basically was, uh, well, it wasn't L2R, it was L2 of R2, but morally, H was the complex numbers. So it was one dimensional. And I have a one dimensional example a little later for you, if, if time permits. So we started out basically with H being the complex numbers. So as simple as you can. But now, of course, we want to do infinite dimensional situations. And so this is what, uh, what I'm going to tell you now. And we're going to look at a particular modal operator. So here's the modal operator. It's used in lots of different contexts. I have a page about that. And so it's of the form DDT plus an operator A, which is a direct integral over fibers, A of T. What about A of T? Well, the A's here are self-adjoint, OK? Not that guy, of course. So DA is not self-adjoint. No, of course not. But A is. And it should have asymptotes. So I want it to have asymptotes in a norm resolvent sense. So I want A of T in a norm resolvent sense in this small Hilbert space. So from now on, I'm going to have two Hilbert spaces, a small one, even though it's infinite dimensional, which is H, and a big one, which is this L2R vector valued objects. Okay? So when I say small operators, I mean the fiber guys, which act in H. And when I say big operators, I mean these guys, which act in the big Hilbert space, OK? So that's going to follow us now for, for a few minutes. So the assumptions are basically we need asymptotes. If you want to do this in the Fredholm case, I will do it first Fredholm, then non-Fredholm. And the big distinction is whether or not the asymptotes are in boundedly invertible. If zero is in their spectrum, game over. Then they are not Fredholm. But you can still compute a Witten index but not, not a Freedom index. If, in fact, as it will turn out, zero is in the resolving set of both asymptotes, then it's a Freedom operator, as we will see uh, with a few additional assumptions here. But they are, they are relatively natural, but they are of relative trace class nature. So what do we really do? Well, we start with the left asymptotes at minus infinity. We add a family B of t. That's my A of t. So from now on, I'm always starting at minus infinity, so to speak, and I work my way to the right. Now, here is a uh, relative trace class assumption. You see, B of t, resolvent of the asymptote, should be trace class. That's not enough. We have a little more. I, I, I want to do a, a short outline, and then I, I'm, at one point, I'm going to tell you the full story. So that's the uh, plus quite a bit more, next two pages. Anyway. Uh, we want to assume enough so that we eventually can say this object is Fredholm, or at least densely defined and closed. And so if it's not Fredholm, we would like to compute its Witten index, of course. If it is 
Fredholm I would like to compute its Fredholm index, which then will equal the Witten index by what we have seen already. So just for clarity, uh, for those who are, uh, I mean, this is sort of uh, about this Hilbert space uh, L2, the big one, and operators that are direct integrals. So what do I mean by this? Actually, a, a much more straightforward way is to look at uh, vector value, so f of t lives in this smaller Hilbert space h. But keep in mind, that Hilbert space is supposed to be infinite dimensional. It's no longer supposed to be just a complex numbers. And so you want that the norm in that space is an L2 function over the variable t. And then uh, here's the scalar product in such a case. Here's the norm. And so this is basically constant fiber Hilbert space is a direct integral with h does not depend on t, it's just constant, okay? So this is a very simple, so there's really no, no reason to talk about direct integrals. It's enough to talk about this vector valued case. So what about operators in, uh, in such a space? So this is my, bold, all the, the big operators are bold phase. And uh, the normal ones like a of t, you should see it here, is not bold phase. So this acts in h, the small Hilbert space here, whereas the bold phase guy, which is sort of a direct integral, now the fibers are not constant, they are in fact these A of T's, uh, acts in the big Hilbert space. Okay, so that's the situation here. And uh, yeah, uh, you have to assume measurability, weak is enough because of the Hilbert space situation here. Uh, and uh, the operator acts as a direct integral, so I actually say how it acts. You see, fiber-wise, you just apply a of t onto f of t, and this is the domain, naturally, so that everything here makes sense. So this is what I mean by, by this. There are some subtleties here about measurability. In fact, there's a nice paper by Nussbaum going back to 64 that has to be invoked, but we can easily express it in terms of weak, weak measurability of these objects. So there are some technical details. Uh, once again, oh, it's this here. Oh, this, is this, this is it, this is it. The yeah, the yes, okay. yes. Yeah, actually, we, we wrote a paper on this subject, so we decided to honor him and call it in. Seems natural. Anyway, so, so there are some, some small technicalities here, but they're not too bad because you see you can basically do this with resolvents. And so it's not, not too bad. So just keep in mind for now on, a of t, these are the fibers. These guys act in the small Hilbert space H, but my bold phase guys act in the big one. Okay? That will, that will follow us now for a little while. We need uh, limits. Uh, I already said uh, in a normal resolvent sense, this will uh, come, uh, will be made precise a bit, a bit later, but we'll, we will come back to that. So here's, in fact, it's repeated here. So, What's so special about this operator? Let's take a look back at it so we know exactly what we're doing. This is the operator. From now on, I want to spend quite a bit of time of my remaining time. So you see DDT plus this bold phase operator in the big Hilbert space, okay? That's my model operator I'm gonna study now. It is a model for a lot of things. Uh, let's go back, oops, here we were. So there is a fairly famous, um, well-known paper by Robin and Salomon from 95, where they studied Maslow index and spectral flow. But in situations where all my fibers had discrete spectrum, okay? So compact resolvent. So what we wanted to do from 2009 on, study situations with essential spectra. Right? So this goes uh, substantially be beyond the, the first attempts here. Okay, so I have some uh, slides for spectral flow, which is very natural in this context, but time is limited, so I'm going to jump forward. Let me look at a one-dimensional example, which is very complete. You can compute everything. This goes back to the late 80s. This is the case, the trivial case, where the small Hilbert space really is small. Now it's just one-dimensional. Let's take a quick look at that and then move on to infinite dimensions, okay? So what is then A is just uh, a C1 function. It has limits uh, in, in, in that there's some uh, 
condition A prime has to go to zero asymptotically, and uh, dA is then just, it's a one-dimensional situation, ddt plus a function, okay? The function is, uh, you multiply by A of t. Remember, now my small Hilbert space is just a complex numbers, okay? So this is uh, fleshed out a little here. What about the two uh, t star t and uh, t t star, which now are called d a star d a and d a d a star? Well, they are one-dimensional Schrodinger operators. And for those, a little bit of background in completely integrable system, this looks like a mirror transformation, and it is. Okay. So this this is something for those who have seen modified quarter vector freeze and quarter vector freeze equations, they will recognize this in a lux pair. Anyway, never mind. This is just a difference in uh, the sign of A prime for these two operators, the big ones, okay? So, of course, in this case, my big Hilbert space is really just L2R. It's a one-dimensional situation. As I said, the simplest possible case. Let's start with that. You can easily figure out the essential spectrum it has to do with the minimum of a minus and a plus squared, where these are the asymptotes of my function a of t. So in particular, if one of them is zero, I'm in trouble with the Fredholm property. So if one of them is zero, I would not have a Fredholm operator. But if both are non-zero, and in fact it's an if and only if statement, this guy is Fredholm if and only if, the asymptotes are invertible. Right? This is what we saw on the operator level a little earlier. Okay, now this is the model. What are the results? Very simple. First of all, you can compute this resolvent regularization for the index. Remember, this is before I take the limit z going to zero from the left. This is just a trace of the resolvent difference multiplied by z. You can actually compute this thing. It's this here, while well, g is a strange object, but it's explicit. You can compute the index, so let's assume now uh, we are in the case, in the Fredholm case, then it's really a Fredholm index. So assume the asymptotes are not zero, you see? I, I'm staying away from zero everywhere. Well, here are the, here are the results. You get, this is, this is what you get. It hap it's exactly the, the same as the Witten index, it's also the same as the spectral shift function from the right of H2 and H1, and you see, this time, integers only. Well, we are in the Fredholm case, of course we get integers. Okay? But you can see that if one of these guys goes to zero, so it's just one and the other does not, formally speaking, suppose A minus is zero, cross it out, you have your one half. You have a fractional index. That's the Levinson theorem. That's the threshold resonance phenomenon that's, that's behind, already seen in this model. Anyway, there's a topological invariance. You see, the index, if you look at it, has nothing to do with the local behavior of A of t. Only the asymptotes enter the game. Okay, so that's topological invariance in the old sense from the 80s. Okay. I have a few more things. So you can, uh, now I'm, uh, I'm looking at a non fredholm case. So now I'm putting a minus zero. It's something I just did. Uh, now I'm doing it officially. Then, bad luck. Central spectrum starts at zero. You're not fed home. Still, you can compute the difference of the dimensions here. And it depends uh, what you get. In uh, these cases, uh, you get zero. There is another one. You can, of course, uh, change this from a minus to a plus. I, I just did one case. It's the same if you put a plus zero. But yes, you get the same, but look at the Witten index. There's your one half that we saw earlier, okay? The Witten index makes a difference. It's not Fred Holmes, so we shouldn't expect. I mean, these two things have, in principle, little in common. And in fact, they do differ. There's the one half. Again, topological invariance. You see, only the asymptotes enter the game. Well, okay, one I put zero, the other I put non-zero. But the local behavior of A of T had nothing to do with it, right? This one half just comes from the sign of the other non-zero asymptote. And again, uh, this is indeed, uh, for those familiar with a little scattering theory of one-dimensional systems, that's a Levinson theorem. So yeah, sure, absolutely. So what can you say about studying the transition? If you move a minus through zero case, it looks like everything is discontinuous there. Is there some kind of 
uh, say that again. If you move now a minus and you follow up what happens as you move a minus from negative to positive values, all of these functions seem to be discontinuous. Well, I, I'm not sure. We are looking at the results. So you're right, they are. I mean, continuous or not, I mean, you, if you define the sine function to be 0 at 0, it sort of fits. OK? But that's all I can say in this, in this context, I think. I mean, formally, we got the 1 half if we turn this guy off. We got the 1 half that we see here officially now. Right? This is the guy when a minus is 0. Now, if both are 0, then you get nothing. OK? So you get 0. And in any case, in all of these cases, it's equal to the spectra shift function for this pair of operators, whether they're afraid or not. In this case, they're not. I have a little more. So this time, the spectra shift function is not just a step function. It's actually, well, there are some arctangents here and, uh, and a step function, you see? So this has a real lambda dependence now. It's not just basically two values like we had in the, in the in some sense, much more complicated two-dimensional magnetic field system. This, this actually shows a little structure here. OK, and so in the non federal case, you can also compute it, shows a little structure. There's another arctangent here. Theta is just my usual state function, and sine is defined like this. OK, so this is uh, the situation when uh, the asymptotes are either non-zero or one of them is put zero. Fredholm, non-Fredholm. OK, let me go back to the model operator where h is, uh, uh, oops, sorry, that was too fast, where h is uh, infinite dimensional. So basically, I'm going to tell a little bit about this paper that we uh, started in 2009 and then got published in 2011. So h here is infinite dimensional now. And uh, there is another reference that really influenced us a lot. You see, this was a year earlier in 2008. So he was the first ever to have some essential spectrum in this game, where Robin and Solomon had only compact resolvents. But he basically did what I sort of described last time in my first lecture as case one in the spectra shift function business, when the perturbation was a trace class. We want a relatively trace class perturbation, so it does apply to differential operators, OK? So he certainly was a trailblazer here. But if you want to do it with Dirac type and so on, differential operators, you need more. And that's what we tried to uh, do. It was a very first step, non-trivial. Anyway, but uh, this is how, how we started in around 2009. OK, so again, you see the situation. An asymptote at minus infinity, then we have a family B that we add, and this is our A of T. These are the fibers. B, so this is what Bushnitsky did. He, he looked at the trace class case immediately. We will look at a relative trace class. So that's the difference. And I can assure you it's a heck of a difference technically. Not from results type, but technically, uh, this is like day and night. You cannot use any of the old tricks in this paper. You have to use double operator integrals, for instance, which were absolutely not necessary in this context, OK? Different situation. So here comes the real set of assumptions. So I, so far, I have thrown a, a lot under the rug. I told you about relative trace class and so on. But so here is a precise uh, list of assumptions. Left asymptote self adjoint. B closed symmetric with a domain larger for all t larger than the left asymptote. You need a derivative. Uh, it's in a fairly weak sense. You need this to be uh, weakly, locally, absolutely continuous. So here's y, because you want, you want to be able to derive it, and you get this b prime. And uh, here is a relative trace class condition, right? There's one. Here's another one. This object, when you take the trace norm, needs to be integrable. Those are non-trivial conditions, OK? They restrict applicability. This is too bad, but it is what it is. And here's no spam. Here's what's left of Nussbaum uh, measurability, OK? So it's, oh, everything else is, is, is part of the other assumptions. 
So here are a few consequences very quickly. So you have a family, well-defined and self-adjoint. You have limits in a normal resolvent sense. Now we are dealing with unbounded operators. You have certain trace class conditions. They all follow from the assumptions that we have. And the essential spectra of all A of T equal the two of the asymptotes, which are equal. So here's the first result. Uh, actually, in this form, it was found a little later by, by some of us. So under this hypothesis, uh, the operator is closed. And you can prove an if and only if statement, which we didn't have in 2009. We had only half the statement. Now it's if and only if. The guy is Freytorm, if and only if A plus and A minus are boundedly invertible. And otherwise it's not. So again, you see that it's closed, was known there, sufficiency was known, but now it's also necessary. Okay? All right, so that's a useful result. Here is something um, that's, I do this only for curiosity, even though I'm running out of time, but that's okay. If you ever wonder about operators whose essential spectra, I mean reasonable operators, whose essential spectra are the whole complex plane, well, here are nice examples of that, okay? Because you can, with our assumptions here, you can compute the essential spectrum, and you see you get the spectrum of the asymptotes plus an imaginary line. And so if the operators A plus and A minus are Dirac-type operators without mass, so that the spectrum is minus to plus infinity, you're gonna fill the whole complex plane naturally. Nothing you can do. Now, don't be discouraged. I never said the A was a nice operator. I just said I wanted to compute its index, either Freytorm if it is, or its Witten index. It's of course not self-adjoint, so it's a, it's a, it, can be a, it can be a crazy situation. And there's one, if you have spectra of both asymptotes the real line, you get the whole complex now. Numbers. Anyway, that's a, a nice example. You know, it's not so easy. I, don't, I mean, at least not so easy to find rele relevant operators which, which have a, a crazy property like that. Okay, I will not talk about the literature, so people who want to read this can do all that. Let's do the following. Let's move on. So here is basically what we proved in uh, 2009, 2010, that then got published in uh, 2011. You just saw the reference. This is a, a nice summary of what we can say. And this is the Freytorn case. I have not touched the non-Freytorn case yet, and I'm not sure I can do too much about it, but I'll do at least something in the case where this Hilbert space, the internal one, where is it? This one, just a small one, is finite dimensional. I will actually give you a complete picture of everything. But let's first go back to the general case. So, the Freytorn property, as we just saw, as an if and only if property, is, is related with the extra assumption that the two asymptotes are boundedly invertible. Okay. Then the Freytorn index exists. It's, of course, this is the definition. Happens to be, and this is interesting, two spectral shifts. That's why I thought this was a nice application of spectral shift functions. There's an internal spectral shift function f between the two asymptotes. Remember, there are resolvent differences trace class, so there is a C for them. But there's also the external one. These are the big operators. Here they are. D A star, D A and D A, D A star. That Freytorn index equals that C function from the right. Remember, H2 and H1 are both non-negative and self-adjoint, so I normalize my C to be zero near minus infinity and go from there. That uniquely determines it. And so this is well defined. This here is a different story. Remember, I'm in the Freytorn situation. There's no spectrum in a small neighborhood of zero. And so therefore, C is locally constant through zero. So I can come from either side. It makes no difference. And it turns out, if you go through all the steps in our, in our paper, the two values are actually equal. One can also, I did not do that, show that these numbers or that index, the Freytorn index, equal the spectral flow for the family A of T for those who are familiar with spectral flow. Finally, you can also express this in terms of a Freytorn determinant. Remember, we had Freytorn determinants at the very beginning today. And it's basically the im log of a Freytorn determinant. So it's the argument of a Freytorn determinant where you take 
a normal or non-tangential limit to the real line uh, at zero energy, basically, because this epsilon disappears, right? And so this, all of that shows, of course, this too, you have path independence. Only the asymptotes enter the game. As we saw in this trivial one-dimensional example, it's true in any dimensions, no matter what the dimension of your Hilbert space. If you satisfy the assumptions that I showed you, uh, this is what one can prove. And so here is just, uh, again, a little, uh, a little more details. So if you really want to compute these big operators H1 and H2, here they are. You see, they are now still one-dimensional operators, but with operator-valued coefficients. Not just matrix, but operator-valued. Why operator-valued? Well, because that's, that's what they are, right? So you have, uh, you have a, the bold-face operators here. And again, you see the Mura transformation for those familiar. In the, 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 the difference between the two is only the sign of the derivative term here. And again, whenever you see a bold-face operator, interpret it as a direct integral over the fiber operators, okay? All right. Now, there's a slight other technicality here. My sum actually has been to be taken in the sense of quadratic forms. That's why I put a little Q here underneath. So this is a general, uh, fairly general uh, approach here. Operator perturbation theory is not enough. You need form perturbation theory. Okay, so I have actually a proof, of course, no time for it. So let me jump forward and do just one more little thing. So all of that will be on the internet by Monday. There's my course on double operator integrals again, my five minute, uh, uh, it's, it's needed. You, you, we, we cannot prove it to this day. What's, what's in that theorem cannot be proven otherwise. Let's look at a special case uh, to finish this up quickly. Let's look at the case where we are in the matrix situation. Okay? In that case, as I write here somewhere, an com absolutely complete picture will emerge. So let's, um, and so this is, this is the case, uh, what I will do, special case dimension finite. Well, now my assumptions are actually minimal. Mm -hmm. uh, it's finite dimensional, so all I need is basically a, 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 a derivative uh, and, and, and the integrability of just a norm. Trace norm or norm is all the same, we are in finite dimensions. So this is very simple. But it's matrix valid, so it's not entirely trivial. Then uh, you introduce, uh, again, you always start with the left asymptote, A minus, then you add B, and then you do the same thing for the bold face ob objects. And uh, here is uh, a first statement. That's just a little lemma. It says that um, the operator dA or dA star, that's sort of a, a, uh, a special case of what we already saw in the infinite dimensional case. Of course, it's free from if and only if zero does not belong to the spectra of the asymptotes. OK. Now, given that, Let's look at some results here. So here I mentioned, let me go back one more time. I mentioned the Fredholm, just to remind you, this is uh, the Fredholm situation. But I will not in insist on that. I will do the Witten situation, where you're not necessarily Fredholm. If you are, fine, then you get an integer. If you're not, you will see what you get. So I'm giving up on Fredholm here. So I mean, still in the finite dimension situation, but no longer assume this Fredholm property. Well, here's the result. So we did this a little later. I do the resolve in regularized Witten index. That's the same for the uh, semi-group regularized. So let's just do one. That's in finite dimension, it makes not, absolutely makes no difference. So first of all, since I'm careful, remember, I'm not assuming Fredholm. So I can no longer assume now that my internal, this, the, 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 the spectral sheet function for the small operators is the same from left and right. It was in the Freytholm situation, but I'm not assuming Freytholm. So there can be a jump now. So see, see what I get here. I get the jump, one half, the arithmetic mean of the jump. I still get the old result, no matter Freytholm or not. I do get that the big operators 
you take the, you normalize xi, this xi for these two guys to be zero at near minus infinity, then everything's unique, and you have to come here from the right. It's the same value as this jump, the arithmetic mean of the jump. And now you have actually very explicit answer for this. Look at that. So there's a definition here. So this symbol with a larger than, uh, and here is a symbol with less. What does it mean? It means the number of strictly positive, that's why I write larger here, or if I use that, number of strictly negative eigenvalues of a self-adjoint operator A. In our case, now it's in a matrix. We are talking about eigenvalues of matrices. Okay? And you see what end, ends up here. The answer, no matter what, fred home or not, it's either an integer or a half integer for any, any uh, matrix or finite dimensional situation. Okay. Uh, much of what I showed you uh, in uh, the uh, picture here, let's go back once more to the general theorem. Almost there. Oops, here we were. So, almost everything you see here actually works in a non fraton case. But I'm running out of time. Yes, I know. No, no, I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. I, I have too much. And so it, it actually is a, this, this finite dimensional result is so nice that uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great, because uh, it's so explicit. You don't necessarily expect this when you start a thing like that, that uh, this is actually, no matter whether you're afraid home or not, this is what you get in this context. Thank you very much. Questions? So, um, I know that there's one classical result connecting spectral flow to the index. Mm -hmm. Then if you have a self-adjoint fretform operator and a unitary conjugate. Mm -hmm. of it, Spectral flow between the two is uh, is given to the associated fret on index that you can find okay. out of mm -hmm. the Hardy projection from one of the objects. Yeah, 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 yeah. So right. And that's very structural in general. I wonder how that fits together with the. Uh, we, we, okay, so so in uh, in the. Let's go back to the, uh, I mean, I probably should go to the end, but let's let's go back to the fret home case and then just ignore fret home. Let's see. Yeah, I, I can see how this general, the Dirac operator comes into the game. Okay, okay. So, so the Dirac operators are, of course, the asymptotes. Okay, so A plus minus are, are the Dirac operators in this game. And uh, this, for instance, is still, is still true in the non-fretum case. This is not true in the non fretum case because this is, it's not clear what, but what you do is you take the left Lebesgue point of that function and the right and take the arithmetic mean and that is still true in a non fretum case. So this was, would have been one of the results and is one of the results at the end of, of this talk, okay? So much of, much of what you see has natural analogs in a non fretum context. But we are not using uh, what you just, so it's a, it's a different approach to it. So we, we, are, we, are, we are relying this on, on different techniques. Okay, I have a question yep. uh, about the, the name itself, uh, Witten index. So I suppose this name was uh, due to because Witten index. Yeah, so Edward Witten. Where did he use it? Okay. Well, it's actually not so clear. I mean, this may be another example of the Arnold, maybe not quite as bad as the Arnold principle. He has something to do with this. Uh, I, I suppose people know about the Arnold principle. It's typically that if something is called after someone, that someone has very little to do with it. Uh, and uh, one always adds that the Arnold principle applies to itself. So. <laughs> anyway, so there is a nuclear physics paper, very well known, that he wrote. And everybody ref refers to that. So of course, I read it back and forth, back and forth. You need some, fa some imagination to find these things in there. But he clearly, he did think about regularized indices. And, you know, I mean, it was a convenient way. And it wasn't chosen by us. So when these papers came in in the middle 80s, 
people had already chosen a written index for it, so we just ran with it. <coughs> but what, what was his application? Or why did he? How did that appear? Well, uh, I, I mean, I, it's 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 too long that I really took a close look at. It. But he was interested in um, field theory, of course. But but he took a step back and worked with quantum mechanics for a little. So it was really what I mentioned a, a little earlier, supersymmetric quantum mechanics. And so within that framework, he, he tried to, I mean, he saw that things need not be Fredholm. So he tried to look for a substitute for the index. And, in, and, and people immediately were interested in invariance properties of this non-index, right? So that was a hot topic in the 80s, so it was a long time ago. Well, yes, thank you. Nice talk. Thank you.